uh, product fragmentation, uh, uh, which is accelerated by the electronic industry characteristic. The first one is, uh, uh, as mentioned, as the product fragmentation means that the production process should be uh, fragmented, should be uh, fragmented, and then electronic industry uh, is characteristic. It is, it has a separable uh, processes, uh, therefore it can be fragmented and. Uh, it's also a very labor intensive in some part, so its developing countries can participate in that uh, uh, electronic uh, production process, starting with a very simple skill. And then the second characteristic that its value to weight ratio is quite high, means that it's still economically economical to transport the part and components to the distant location because the part is small and it's not too heavy. While, for example, for the automotive industry, the part is tends to be larger and heavier, so the uh, uh, the relocation usually is not far compared to the electronic industry. As you can see, this is the uh, comparison between the production of the part and components of electronic and the trade of part and components, electronic part and component, and we can see that there is a big differences between between the production and the trade. It can be it implies that each of the part and components will travel several times during the process of production because the production and the trade uh, it's quite uh, different. Uh, and this also um, an example of evidence that there is a high intensity of the production fragmentation in the electronics industry. Well, this is worldwide, yeah? Worldwide, yeah. So this is still worldwide. But mostly in, in East Asia. Yes. Yeah. Is that right? It's mostly in East, East Asia, Asia, right? Yeah, oh, okay. so that's why the next one is well. like, I think both of them can like see what's what's coming. So this, uh, why is Asia, like Pak Peter and Pak Te mentioned that uh, most of the production fragmentation in electronic industry is happening in East Asia. Why is in Asia? Because East Asia is a favorable choice for the US and the Japanese firm. Uh, they already have, we already have the some basic technological capacities uh, from the 1960s uh, flow of uh, technology back in 1960s when the US and Japanese electronics uh, firms first try to relocate some of their production in Asia. The second one, uh, the, the second factor is uh, Asia or is Asia have a large market compared to Europe and, and Africa. And also the third one, we have the abundant low cost labor which relatively skilled labor. So it's not just uh, cheap but it's we also relatively higher uh, skilled labor. And also, I have a question. Yes, but uh, what about Korean firm? Mm -hmm. uh, are they not involved in this? You said yes. mostly US and Japanese. But because the uh, or or the Taiwanese firm. Uh, because uh, in the electronics industry, there's a uh, stages in the production. So the first stages like the US and Japanese first uh, relocated to the to the Korea and Taiwan, and then the second stages of the second flow is when the, the Taiwan and Korean. Uh, relocate there. So there's a second, the, the second Korea stage. is the second stage because then when the labor cost in Taiwan and Korea are getting higher, then they move to the second layer of the uh, countries, uh, East Asian countries like Singapore and Malaysia. Yeah. And then the next one is the comes because it's uh, China, China, Singapore and uh, Malaysia. The, the, the third layer, the, the third stages, but when the production, the labor cost in those countries increases, then they start uh, relocating to the next uh, the next uh, level of country, which is Vietnam, Indonesia, Philippines. Oh. So it's, it comes in the stages. Yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Can I just, sorry, just ask one other thing. I mean, you mentioned specifically U.S. And Japanese firms, and what I'm thinking of is that in my model, or as I'm thinking about this, these are what the sort of final consumers or the leaders or something of the industry. Mm -hmm. They generate the sort of backward linkages or the backward demand. Yeah? Mm -hmm. I mean, so the key decisions about the industry overall, what you might call key 
leadership decisions mm -hmm. are taken by yes. big firms mm -hmm. uh, like Microsoft and Dell mm -hmm. and so on, the, the big ones in the US and Japan. Is that yes. right? Is yeah. that, yeah. Is so, so in a sense, the initiative yes. comes from US yeah. and they spread backward demand. Is yes. that? Yeah. And what are the key firms? Microsoft is, or, or, uh, or that software, yeah? We're talking about hardware here, right? Hardware, just so, like the computer, and then also like the... To Toshiba. Toshiba, Panasonic, uh, the Japanese. And then uh, in US, it's like before, it's a Fairchild and... Uh, Next, yeah. And this is... Yeah, 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 yeah. Okay, okay. Yeah, so okay. it's just... Uh, and then first they come to... Right. Uh, first there... The distillation is uh, like Korea. Uh, yeah, okay. and, then, and then they do it further yeah, down. Yeah, much further down. So if there's a uh, happening uh, uh, on this thing. Okay. And then if, if, if you look at what is Indonesian position, this is the share of the electronic part of our export of these countries to the world export like Japan, China, and Indonesia is like this blue one, which is this small Mitchell's blue. Mitchell's yeah. Mitchell's so the, the export of a pulp and components for Indonesia, it's very small compared to Japan, and then this is China, which is, you can see that the, their uh, share on the world export is getting bigger and bigger. Yeah. And if you want to see not just the not that the value of export uh, part and component is low, but the share of the electronic part and component to the manufactured export in each country. Mm -hmm. So now we we look at each country. So this China mean, means that for uh, no uh, China is 1990 there's no uh, there's no data on China yet because mm -hmm. there's not have not to join the WTO, so it started in 1996, if I'm not mistaken. For example, Indonesia 4.2 uh, figure here means that the share of the uh, export of electronic part and component to the total manufactured export in Indonesia is only 4.2%. Yeah, compared to, for example, Philippines. It's oh. surprising for me when mm -hmm. I see with data because we never see Philippines as the one of the leading leader in the electronics uh, industry, but actually their export share of the part and component to their total manufacturing export is quite high. Yeah. And then if we, so. But part, part of that's driven because you're uh, uh, finalized. I mean, back in 1990, the issue with the low percentage for Indonesia was probably that we were selling lots of final uh, video cassette recorders. Mm -hmm. I mean, there, there were a lot of company, uh, Japanese electronics companies that had set up here for final assembly, yes. not for yeah. parts. Yeah. yeah. So uh, as one, uh, also, I think one in the electronic industry, Indonesia is uh, the export is uh, uh, low because it's served more domestic market mm -hmm. than to yeah. export it to other. And then when I do, I did the interview with the electronic industry. They said that. The main reason they set up their industry in Indonesia is just to serve the domestic market. So there's no export uh, orientation yeah. in there uh, when setting up their... Because of the, the anti-export anti -export bias in the trade regime. Right? Yeah. And then if, uh, when we compare it to the GDP, we can see that the Indonesian... Hang on, hang on. Can you go back? Yes. Look at 2010, Indonesia's share has still declined. Yeah. No, no, but... 294 is 1.73. Oh, sorry, sorry. The Vietnam. Oh, that's Vietnam. So it can, it means that maybe Vietnam has other export because this is the share of the electronic parts and components to the manufacturing export. So the the lower share is Vietnam doesn't mean that Vietnam exports less, but maybe the share of the share, of the electronic parts and component is lower. So maybe they export other. Uh, commodities. But the Vietnamese and the Philippines also declined. Yeah. You have data figures of 2011? Uh, no. Not yet in this. Uh, and then if we compare it to the GDP, we can see that uh, Indonesian share of uh, export part and component is very low, less than 1%, and other is 
uh, more than one percent, and then for Philippines, Malaysia. Uh, Malaysia is uh, more than thirty percent. Twenty-four percent. Yeah, twenty-four percent. Yeah. But it has declined. Yeah, it's all declined. This is things like chips, right? What What are we? Yeah, what are we talking about? What goods are we talking about? Uh, so there's a three uh, three parts. This is like uh, electronic components, uh. consumer electronic component, and yeah. also the industrial electronics. But it's all part and component. So uh, right. from the SITC, uh, I follow the Chandra's classification on parts and component. Uh. So so they he take out all the final goods. And then just look at the parts and components. Yeah, but I'm looking at Malaysia, for example. Malaysia's got very high share to GDP, 24 percent. I mean, that's a lot. Mm -hmm. So what? what, what yeah. I'm just wondering what they are. Do you know what? What are they? Are they chips or what? I mean, you, you have the big. I mean, Penang's just full yeah. of of Intel. They've got a couple of fabs up there, so they're actually they actually are doing chips. Mm -hmm. yeah. But they're doing all sorts of other things. And this also includes probably partially made up boards, right. so, yeah. and, and it includes oh. cathode ray tubes. So it's oh. a, it's a it's a wide variety of electronic components. It's everything that's not a, you know something you can plug into the wall and turn on. It's the, so, stuff, it's the stuff inside. It's the stuff. It's all the and it's all the stuff inside. So it could be resistors. It could be potentiometers. It could be anything. Okay. Right. Uh, okay. Right. But I mean, for Indonesia, back you know a while ago, I mean, we used to be a big producer of cathode ray tubes. Yes. Um, so a lot of it was television tubes. Yeah, but then with the, the technology changes, that's not the. Big then we got cream. Yeah, <laughs> because with the technology change in the television, or the mm -hmm. the the tube is not longer needed. If you compare 2005 and 2010, we see that the share, uh, the next slide, so yes, we see that the, the share uh, with the GDP, they are decreasing, but what about the nominal, they also decrease or still uh, larger? Uh, nominal? Uh, I don't remember. I don't <laughs> yeah. remember, uh, remember the number. So. For, 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 Mal for Malaysia, it has to be going up because the yeah. decline in shares. Not. I mean, their their growth rates five percent <coughs> a yeah. year. One assumes that that means that it would be probably right. It would be rising in nominal terms. Okay. Yeah. <coughs> so now with that, I uh, I have to research question. What is like? We can see that the participation of each country is different in the global production method. So I want to know what are the determinants of a country uh, to participate in the global production network. And the second one is why is Indonesia missing out? Why we are not doing uh, as good as other countries? So uh, the theoretical framework, I use the uh, Jones and Kraskowski framework on the global production network, or the product fragmentation, sorry. So, um, the global production network occurs when, the, like I mentioned, the process of production can be separated into a different different uh, production block, and it's relocated. They are relocated to a, to different can, different uh, location or even different countries. But the global production means that it's a globally, it's relocated globally. And there are three contributory factors that uh, make the global production network occur. Sorry. The first one is the development of the production technology. For example, before the electronic uh, industry, usually one company will uh, produce from initial until the end, like until the finished product. But then there is a what we call the modular production. So they, they can now just uh, produce one module. So uh, for example, the, for the computer, there's a module of maybe just for the a screen and module for the keyboard so now they can separate the process of production and then they can also relocate one of this part of the process of production to other location and the second one is also the trade level liberalization because when if the firms relocate the part of the production process to other countries means that they have to export and import the parts component maybe several times during the process of production. If there is a, a strict import tariff or something, it will discourage uh, the firms to relocate it to other countries. And also the, the third one is the advancement in the communication and the transportation. Once you relocate, relocate your uh, production process to other lo location, means that you have to have the coordination between one firm or one plant to other plant. 
with the advancement in technology and also the communication, then it's easier for the firm and it's cheaper for the firm to do the coordination. So the three factors actually contribute to the uh, increase of the global production. Effort. This last one, by the way, I mean, your last point there now, in current jargon, mm -hmm. is connectivity. Yes. <laughs> current. <laughs> Yeah. Current catchphrase. Yes, connectivity, which is uh, will relate so much with the infrastructure and yeah, 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 yeah. and communicate. Yeah, yeah. yeah. So uh, and then once we relocate the uh, part of the production process into to other location, means that there is a has a cost that we have to we have to consider. So the production fragmentation will occur if one, the production cost uh, reduce, meaning that we take uh, advantage of the comparative advantage of one country. If one country have a low labor cost, means that that firm or that uh, one firm can relocate the process of production who need more labor into the cheaper, uh, uh, to the country with a cheaper labor cost. But of course, we also have to think about that service link, which is the coordination, the cost of coordination. Although, if although the labor cost cheaper, but if the coordination cost is higher, then it's not beneficial for the firm to relocate to other country. That's why there are two uh, costs that have to consider: the production cost or relative cost, and also the service link cost connect production block, uh, one production block to another. The production cost or relative cost includes the labor cost and also the technology change and the nature of the production technology. While the service link cost includes like transportation cost, communication cost, uh, trade policy, and also foreign investment policy. Therefore, a country is considered to participate actively in the global production network if both export and import uh, of parts and components increase significantly over time. So in my dissertation, I focus on the international linkage instead of the production network internally, domestic production network. The problem is just uh, basically about the data availability because it's, it's easier to uh, look at the export import data than the data uh, for uh, companies uh, like firms relation in the country because Sometimes the data is not comparable from country to country. The dependent variable is the should be real value, real value of export of electronic part and component. And then the explanatory variable, I divide it into three uh, group, relative cost, service link cost, and other variable. So this is my estimation model. The first one is the relative cost, which is uh, consists of labor cost and the real expenses, which is uh, as a competitiveness of the country. The second is the service link cost, have a trade cost, trade openness, infrastructure and FDI openness, and the other variable is the country dummy and time dummy variables. So this is the, the regression model, right? by the left hand side is the real export of, real value of export. So I have a full data for 98 countries from 1988 to 2007. I stopped in, in 2007 because I afraid that 2008 and 2009, the data may be affected by the global crisis that time. So just to make my life easier, that I made this stop in 2007. Use the least square value variable. And uh, because of uh, possibility of the energy problem, I use the instrumental variable. And uh, I use also the standard error of the why would you also prefer to call it democracy and political institution in your model? It's just a, it's a common uh, instrumental variable to use uh, in the gravity model and also just to see uh, something that related to the export but not directly related to the mm -hmm. other variable. So the, the result, so I uh, divided the countries between developed and developing countries. You see, and then uh, the factor that significant, significantly affects the export value is the labor cost, trade openness, and also infrastructure. So these three, uh, three uh, factors that contribute to the 
that determines a big uh, country decision or firm's decision to invest to one country. The FBI openness here have a unexpected result, negative, because we expect we have a positive FBI. Uh, what? Excuse me. <laughs> what? Uh, what are the indicators of the FBI openness? The FBI openness. I use the flow of uh, uh, stock. Stock FBI stock open GDP. Oh, yeah. 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 All FDA flow. Uh, one of them I forgot. <laughs> you can use both. Yeah. Okay, so with this uh, result, I conclude that at least there are three factors uh, that uh, affecting the participants in GPN. One is the infra infrastructure condition. Because if you see the infrastructure have a quite a uh, significant and uh, have a big uh, coefficient. The second one is skilled labor. In here, we have the labor cost is positive. Usually we think that the labor cost will have to negatively uh, affect the export, but this one positive. But I think it's also possible because in the electronics industry, uh, they use a skilled labor than the unskilled labor. So the value of export is actually depends on the skilled labor. The more skilled you have, uh, the most that the you labor has means that you will produce or export the higher value of export, and the skilled labor is reflected in the higher wage or a higher relative wage. Yes. That's why I have the positive. It's still reasonable to have a positive uh, uh, coefficient. In this. Therefore, now we know that Indonesia is uh, missing out. So there are challenges faced by Indonesia by Indonesia to increase particip participation in the GPN. The first one is like the quality and the quantity of infrastructure in Indonesia. Comparing to other Asian countries, actually uh, condition, uh, the infrastructure condition is the second most problematic factor in for doing business in Indonesia. What is the first problematic? What is the first most problematic factor? Uh, business uh, is a uh, is of doing business first. Oh, oh. You're based on the World Bank. Yeah. 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 Uh, okay. Uh, you say that uh, Indonesia is ranked 56, while Malaysia is 26, and the top Thailand is 49. And also based on the survey conducted by JPRO, the, the Japanese uh, firms feel that the underdeveloped infrastructure are the third most important barrier in the service sector. Mm. And then the second one is the uh, less uh, foreign, uh, less open foreign investment regime, and also less friendly business environment in Indonesia. Although Indonesia already implemented the investment law in 2007, but the problem is there is no clear implementation regulation, and sometimes also the interpretation of the law. Even between among the government officials, they always have a different interpretation of the law. So it uh, increases the uncertainty for the business. So when they have some problem, if they ask to one government, they will have a different answer when they ask to other government. So there's no, this should be a, there's uh, a lack of uniform interpretation. No coordination. I, yeah. I think I make a typo in the presentation. I still use lack. LEG is not a, instead of LECK, so please. <laughs> I just said, like, oops, it should be a lack of uniform interpretation of the law, negative, uh, negative please. And then also, second, the foreign ownership restriction that still applies in Indonesia is also discouraged uh, firms, especially the one who has a pri pri proprietary rights. Because if you don't have 100% ownership, how can you, the, the firm will afraid to really uh, open their technology, yeah. so the transfer of technology also not, not as much as if they have 100% of ownership. I have a question. Yes. Do you, does, any, does your research include the effect of the decentralization of decisions uh, you know, to the more on the provincial level? Uh, no, I not go. On how uh, that affects yeah. kind of the investment that's easier or harder now? Uh, I uh, explain a little bit about that uh, in one of the chapter that how the decentralization also makes uh, makes things 
uh, worse or harder yeah, for the firm. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, yeah, because yeah. like like some one of the uh, there's a region that's very open that they welcome the foreign investment and they have a uh, good facilities and everything is okay. But on other region, so it all depends on the quality of the leadership in each right. region. So that's also complicate the <laughs> complicate the situation. And also, uh, I think this uh, foreign, the less open and less friendly business environment really hit the electronic industry in Indonesia. Like in the 1980s, actually Indonesia already uh, become a host for a two big semiconductor industry, yeah. the Fairchild and the uh, NSC. But then when they want to autom automatize yeah. Automatize the 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 process production means that they want to reduce the labor but do more with the machine. The government of Indonesia reject and then yeah. So so I should I quote from Pak Tay's paper. So they they said that you cannot do that. You have to keep the labor. That's why then both of that those two big company moved to Malaysia. So we lost. One. And you never came back? Never so came back. What company? Uh, Next time, same microdactyl and Fairchild. Fairchild. The second one is 2003. The Sony also yeah. move up. Yes. And I think the last hit is like last year, when the RIM, the, oh. the Blackberry, yeah. Yeah. although we are the biggest market yeah. of Blackberry yeah. in yeah. Asia, but they put their uh, firm or plants in Pena, not Indonesia. Yeah. And then what they get, for my perspective, making a situation get worse is that the reaction of the Indonesian government was also angry. is yeah was angry. So I make an analogy like for example, you have a class for a girl, one girl, but the girl choose your friend instead of you, and then you scold the girl. Why you don't choose me? Why you choose my friend? So instead of looking back to myself that why I'm not chosen by that beautiful girl, <laughs> just like blame the girl and then okay you cannot come to me, you cannot ask for my favor because. The reaction of government of Indonesia at the time is, okay, we won't give you any incentive, there's no more, and we can put higher uh, import tariff for your Blackberry. So, instead of making things easier, more the reaction is make more difficult. So, that's a, like one another example that, see, Indonesia, although we have is attractive, but it's not that attractive. The, so. the English phrase is biting off your nose to spite your face. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, you should give this presentation to Mr. Hidayat. <laughs> <laughs> uh, actually, the, the reason I, uh, the, the, the initial, uh, what, why I use this, uh, I choose this topic for my dissertation is my experience working with the Ministry of Industry. Oh. Back in 2006, 2007, I could see oh, that. What the of the uh, That time still, but all like all the because I'm I'm working with the working level, oh, not, yeah, not yeah. the. Not but the, I can see that they, they they don't have this clear vision about no. where the industry of Indonesian industrialization will go. No. So it's just like they always just uh, the their force is actually the industrial force, like the company force. So there's there's. The, the main reason I yeah. choose this. And then the last one is the, the, the not the last one. The third challenge that Indonesia faces is the quality and the availability of skilled labor. For the completion rate of the tertiary education, Indonesia is quite low. And I just, uh, Pak Te and Hathil just have, uh, have one paper on the BS on the universities. But Yes, an yeah. updated paper, yeah, update, update. which we wrote for the update, which yeah. will be published next year. Yes, okay. And then also, Indonesia technology capacity is limited, and from the uh, from the uh, survey conducted by the USDA or something, actually, the percentage of the R&D investment of the American companies in Indonesia is the lowest compared to other uh, countries. Indonesia only 0.6% of, of their uh, investment is put in the R&D. While in Singapore and Taiwan, it's like 19% of the US firm's investment is put into R&D. China is 14.9 and Malaysia is 11.2. 
And I think what about Thailand? Thailand, <laughs> I don't remember the oh. number, but I'm not there. And then also, I think yesterday the Minister of Manpower of Indonesia also complained about the quality of the university graduate. It's very disappointed. Mm. Mostly they are from Sospol and economy. Yeah. But I think, and then what Indonesia should do? I think we all know that infrastructure connectivity is very important. Like we we have to improve our infrastructure because, like when I did the interview with the firms in Cikarang and Cibitu, I asked them how about the traffic jam? Oh, we already put it in the our cost. So it's just make the Indonesian product is less competitive because. They have to either they do the logistic like uh, bring all their uh, part and company or their goods to the port like late night where there's no traffic jam, or if they have to do a traffic jam, they have to put like another two or three hours time like to anticipate the traffic jam, mm -hmm. and then improve the investment policy. They have to uh, give the certainty, especially the certainty to the foreign investor. And as well as for the education level, we have to have a matching between the what the industrial need and what the education sector can provide. Because now there is a disconnection between what the industrial need and then what the school curriculum is necessary. And there's also, I think lately there is a uh, plan to just uh, no English curriculum anymore in the. Uh, in school and there's no physics, there's no social studies in school, it's just more religious, I don't know what they are thinking, so. So I think that's all my presentation, hopefully it's informational and then thank you, Pak Peter. Thank you. We've had a number of interruptions and so on for Bumukti, so our, our time probably now is rather limited, but are there any other questions or comments. We've got five or six minutes before we move on to Kian Wee's presentation. Um, comments, questions? Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> I have one, uh, let me see, uh, let me see, it was back to your slide number five, slide number five, where you listed uh, background East Asia is a favorable choice for the US and Japanese firms because of these factors. Mm -hmm. Technology, large market, low cost labor, and more open and friendly environment. Uh, I mean, what, uh, what also occurred to me was, uh, that maybe it's, maybe you catch it in the last variable, but what about just business links? Mm -hmm. I mean, what I'm thinking here is that in practice, uh, sometimes, sometimes, I mean, I'm not sure we economists recognize this, mm -hmm. but sometimes in practice, frankly, personal links and so on are terribly important. Where do people feel comfortable? Now, uh, my impression is that uh, certainly the Japanese seem to feel yeah. relatively comfortable in some parts of Asia, Southeast mm -hmm. Asia. I'm not sure about this. This, if yeah, you like, is, this, if you like, is a hypothesis. I mean, my hypothesis. Yeah. Mm -hmm. is, my hypothesis is that one of the fact, not the only factor, obviously, or not not the only one, mm -hmm. but when the business men and women, I guess in Japan, they're mainly men. Mm -hmm. When they are sitting there in Tokyo, one of the things they think about is where do I, where is it easy for us to go? Mm -hmm. Where where are we accepted, and where do we have links? Mm -hmm. So in a way, this yeah. is the choosing the easy way out. Mm -hmm. But it's quite important, actually. We all, we all tend to go on the base. In other words, they go on the basis of contacts yeah. and personality factors rather than purely yes. economic factors. Yeah. Yeah. Now, yeah. This now I, don't, I don't know. Maybe you capture it under more open and friendly environment for FDI. Maybe you capture it there. but. Yeah. What, what, what do you say about yeah, that? But actually, uh, uh, you're absol absolutely right, Pak Peter, because uh, in my interview, when I asked the, the company, which is like Japanese aff affiliated company, the reason like the reason they have a Japanese uh, affiliated because usually 
the the director like the Indonesian director have a good personal relation with yeah, yeah. someone in Japan like maybe yeah. they go together in yeah, the yeah. university or something oh, like that. Like so. Right so, by Google, eh? Yeah. Right. Yeah. So so this and then also I think uh, one thing that makes it easier in the East Asia like the Chinese connection. Mm, it's yeah, also yeah. it's sure. quite strong in yeah. Asia, like yeah, sure, sure. in uh, like uh, in China, Taiwan, yeah, sure, sure. Indonesia, uh, Singapore. There's a Chinese connection that really yeah, makes. And, and somebody has an uncle or a cousin. Yeah. You yeah. ring up your uncle. Yeah. So so yeah. so in addition to the business and uh, business uh, environment, yeah. actually, uh, personal relation is really, especially for Japanese company. I think it's it's quite in one of the factor that they really think like but Peter said when you want to is is this any guarantee that I expect accepted there something like that and, and also I I confirmed that in the interview that mostly most of the com most of the Japanese affiliated companies that I interview the director or the, the, the executive have a personal relation with Japanese either they went to Japanese school or they share the same so they have Personal relation. Not no, it's probably less important for the U.S. Is it, or for the know, US, what do you think? Tim, you know about this. I mean, yeah, I, I, I'm not arguing non-economic, or I'm arguing sort of non-economic stuff. No, no, I think that's also true because, like yeah. the U.S., they they prefer come to Thailand and Philippines and Indonesia because they're more welcome there in Thailand and uh. in Thailand and Philippines and Indonesia. They they have less uh, anti-U.S. Bias. Well, yeah. Philippines is easy. Is, I mean, from the point of view of linkages, Philippines is easy, right? Uh, mm -hmm. A lot of English and strong US mm -hmm. links. So mm -hmm. Philippines is easy. Mm -hmm. What about Thailand and Thailand? Thailand is also easy because they, for for my 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 own per perception, Thailand don't have this uh, colonialism yeah. Uh, yeah, yeah. Or this yeah. trauma. Yeah, yeah, yeah. chip yeah. on the shoulder. Yeah, yeah. yeah. like yeah. Indonesia, we always fear about the foreign investor right. because we have right. this. Uh, 350 yeah. colonization period then yeah. the if the foreigner come they just want to extra and then left yeah. so yeah. i think back in our mind we have fear, self, fear of yeah. exploitation yes mm. when okay. thailand they never being colonized so mm. they don't have that anti there's a bias anti well, foreigner was also colonized why why do not why don't they have such a check on the shoulder but I think the I don't know. Good maybe question. Maybe, yeah, maybe it's more they, than the they historian. Do, they do if you're not in Penang, right? <laughs> I mean, it actually, I mean, it would be an interesting question to look at the. I mean, if you got the whole um, Malaysia. Pre, in, in Malaysia, you've got that whole Mahathir taking Thai. over of all of industry oh. by pre Bumis and uh, Arab oh, yes. and so that whole. Th I mean, they they actually have a pretty big pushback, but except have, for yeah. Penang. Where so, the state government in Penang, I mean, it, it's a little bit of the, it's a little bit of the, um, I suspect the difference in governance mm -hmm. in Malaysia, mm -hmm. where the provincial governments have, have a lot of power, have a mm -hmm. have a fair amount of power. So basically, Penang could go do whatever the heck it wanted, mm -hmm. and the rest, and you know, yeah. and so. I think most of the most of the industrialization in. Malaysia is actually centered in Penang, isn't mm -hmm. it? Well, a lot, of, certainly in the electronics. Oh, yeah, in the electronics. Mini Singapore. Yeah, eighty percent of the population are Chinese. Mm -hmm. yeah. I, right. I want to report that a Malaysian friend of mine once told me that they were always so happy when Australia beat Britain in cricket. <laughs> they because they, they don't like the English. So yeah. they were so happy. <laughs> but uh, but I, I mean Thailand I mean, is, in, in, is an interesting case because it doesn't have the advantage of English and mm -hmm. former colonization mm -hmm. by the U.S. that the Philippines has. Um, it's more like Indonesia in, in that way. Mm -hmm. um, why American firms might prefer to be there over uh, here. Yeah. Yeah, I think one one of the reason is like the certainty of the policy in Thailand. There's not Indonesia. You always have the change of policy, like yes, in the automotive, yes. in yes. electronic. They always have yes, a yes. constant change of the policy, which is make less certainty to the investor. But in Thailand, they have like uh, it's all certain. Like okay, yes. if you invest like this, these are the facilities that we are provided. So it's. That certainty, I think, is needed for the investor. Yeah. That's, mm -hmm. I think, 
this is a one of the conclusion also in my, yeah. my chapter. So. Okay, listen, we probably uh, better wind up. Oh, it's like one more question. Yeah. What, what about the, the local movement you, you are not uh, yeah, including in, in here? Like um, very important. Uh. Yeah. I know that I think the UMR is also I think I not in the in the presentation but mm. in my dissertation I mm. touch a little bit about the especially the UMR mm. which is with the UMR is also a uh, one factor that discourage the the mm. foreign investor because they see that although the UMR uh, keep uh, increases yeah, yeah. but the productivity is not okay. so that's the concern of the business man is the productivity mm -hmm. they they want to pay high mm -hmm. if the productivity also high mm -hmm. but the fact is like is also uh, based on my interview mm -hmm. once they have the UMR the productivity is declined mm -hmm. because for the labor is the same if they before uh, they pay based on how many for mm -hmm. example chips they 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 uh, produce but mm -hmm. with the UMR you, you so it's and then so it's the productivity is uh, getting lower because mm. you work or you not work, you can get, you still get the UMR. Yes. And then the worst thing, the bad employer, mm. employee, employer or employer, em employee. the labor is employee, yeah. employee, employee mm. try to influence the good one. Mm. Even they threaten mm. the good one. Yeah. If you work that hard, mm. you don't have to work that hard. It's not just like persuasion, but sometimes it's threaten the good one mm. to pressure, pressure to. Yeah low mm -hmm. their productivity so it's also one concern on the and then that one is i do i did the interview in batap which is we expect is the the environment is better than in, in jakarta but that's the umr is uh, is so uh, it's higher it's higher and then uh higher and then the productivity is get, getting lower and lower lower, lower. so mm -hmm. and then the, the why, why is the productivity lower because they work or not they still get the umr part. Mm -hmm. Before they get the wages based on their productivity. Mm -hmm. If they can produce ten, they mm -hmm. get paid ten. Mm -hmm. But now they produce two, they get still get the UMR. They produce ten, they get still UMR. So ah, why bother? Yeah. <laughs> and what about the demonstration? Yeah, and then also demonstration also mm -hmm. affect because like they have to shut down the mm -hmm. the firm. Mm -hmm. And like if I'm not mistaken, when when they shut down, one day is cost them like million mm -hmm. rupiah something. I will take back this time. Okay, no, no, no. See, I think we, 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 the idea is that we have these two presentations, so we'll, if you, with your agreement, uh, I yeah. hope we can move on now yeah. to, we change gear, we change topic. Yeah, now, next, uh, next, next discussion is uh, about Kianwi. Uh, Kianwi, I think you probably all know Kianwi. Kianwi is Terkenal, everybody knows Notorious. Kianwi. Notorious. 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 Notorious and Terkenal, and uh, Kianwi is from Lipi. But he's sleepy, been, leapy. sleepy, leapy. He's been at the ANU and he goes everywhere. He goes to Japan and to Europe and so on. He, 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 he loves economic history and he really wanted to talk today about economic history. But I, I, he sent me he sent me six slides, six different presentations to look at, and I thought this one was the best. So even though he likes economic history, we're doing the current economics today. Silakan back here, thank you. Okay. Thank you, uh, Peter, for inviting me to present uh, paper. Uh, this paper is based on a, a longer chapter, which is presented here. But I'm updated because that was that was published two two years ago. Uh, well, I'm talking about the Indonesia coming after the global financial crisis, which uh, occurred in 2008. And I'll give a sh short historical overview about the reasons why the global financial crisis uh, occurred and uh, why Indonesia was less affected by the global financial crisis than other countries in East Asia. First of all, I will talk about the effects of the global financial crisis on the Southeast Asian economies which, as we know, uh, uh, occurred when the Lehman Brothers, an American investment bank, collapsed on the 15th of September 2008, which sparked massive sell-offs on stock exchanges and foreign exchange markets around the world, which actually was a flight to safety. After the fall of the Lehman Brothers, the East Asian economies all were all confronted 
why acceleration in the financial turbulence that had started actually already in mid 2007. Fortunately, Indonesia, like the other South Asian countries, Malaysia, Thailand, and the Philippines, withstood the financial turbulence well. Because they were better prepared for the shock after their experiences, so they learned from their experience, with the Asian financial crisis of 97 98. Over the past 15 years, the South Asian countries, including Indonesia, have strengthened their external balances, reduced government debt to ensure fiscal sustainability. As you know, uh, after the Asian financial crisis, the uh, government debt was around 100% of GDP. And now it's, I think, just over 20% of GDP. So Indonesia's macroeconomic policies have been very good, certainly better than the US and the, and the Euro country. And they have also improved banking supervision, which was the reason for the uh, Asian financial crisis. First of all, I talk about the effects of the global financial crisis on the Asian economy. In the first quarter of 2008, the disruption in the growth economy hit the English economy through the trade channel as export oriented industries contracted sharply, with, of course, ad adverse effects on employment. And the strong growth of non oil and gas exports, which had already uh, started since the late 80s, ended abruptly in the fourth quarter of 2008 as the imports. The drop in exports were most evident in this act of China, which recorded a large contraction of 22%. Export to, the, to Japan, the US, and the European Union, and the other Asian countries also declined. Because Indonesia's merchant exports are still dominated by primary exports, Indonesia's agriculture sector, and also, of course, the mining sector, <coughs> were also adversely affected. In general, Indonesia some only suffered relative mild effects from the global financial crisis. And, uh, and I'll try to explain why. Because together with China and India, Indonesia was only, was only one of only three Asian countries <coughs> which were still recording positive growth after the global financial crisis, <coughs> which just ensured st a steady decline in the incidence of absolute poverty. Indonesian economy grew at 4% in the year to which June 2009, with, and which this, and this, uh, this reflected a greater res resilience than some of its neighbors. <coughs> also, there was a mild decline in economic growth compared with the preceding seven years. This decline uh, was lower than the global average. <coughs> and that of Indonesia's neighbors, including Malaysia, Singapore, and Thailand, which are much more exported than Indonesia, because Indonesia's export to GDP ratio is only 17% at that time. Thank you. Indonesia's economic performance during the global financial was also much better than, the, than during the Asian financial crisis. The effects of the global financial of the Indian economy. There are three reasons why Indonesia is vulnerable to effects of the, or to the adverse effect of the global financial crisis was less than that of the Asian neighbors. First of all, Indonesia has had the low share of manufacturers and its total exports. It's rather low share of the legal trade and total trade and the rather of the low degree of export-led growth, because it's more domestic oriented. Compared with the South Asian neighbors, the share of Indonesia's manufacturing share was rather low in 2005-2006, only 12.5% of its GDP, compared with Singapore's 157%, Malaysia 75%, the Philippines 35%, and Thailand's 48%. On the other hand, Indonesia's its share of primary exports in its total merchandise was the highest at 44%. Compared with Malaysia's 18%, the Philippines 73%, I think it's a mistake. No? And Thailand's 
The first reason why Indonesia is rather low dependent on manufacturers, which is less vulnerable to the global financial crisis, that was that manufacturing exports have much higher income illicit than private exports. Hence, the demand for manufacturing exports falls sharply during recent in a major export world, as was the case with Indonesia. Because yeah, Indonesia's share in, of manufacturing export was much lower. The second reason why Indonesia was not hurt by the global financial crisis compared to the other South Asian countries was that it had and still has not participated in a major way in the region production trade, production trade, as already explained by Dr. Uh, Mukti. That is the cross-border dispersion of parts and components production is in vertically integrated production process. The reason for this was its ambiguous editors and the world is already explained much better than, than Dr. Bukti. The third reason why Indonesia was not as vulnerable to the transmission of the global financial crisis was that Indonesia's ground growth was not as export-led as in South Asian neighbor, as I already explained. The fourth reason why Indonesia was less vulnerable to the transmission of the global financial crisis that it was not large exposed relative to its GDP to banks in the US the European Union and Japan, and has avoided large credit exposures to subprime loans, as was the case in the US, and securities in the US. Hence, according to me, in recent to better informers was to some extent more by default than by design. So it was lucky, not because it was so wise. <laughs> Backlink the big adverse crisis of the global financial crisis. The fiscal stimulus measures, including tax cuts, skillful monetary policy and direct cash transfer to the poor significant way to softening the adverse effect of the crisis. Moreover, the parliament election in April 2009 and the president election in July 2009 provided further economic stimulus because of the election related spending by parliament minutes on potential voters, perhaps in trying to bribe them, <laughs> also contributed to the household incomes of the poor. These stimulus measures help maintain employment in the informal sector and the proportion of casual workers in the labor force. Indonesia's rent to slow economic growth also now slightly faster than that of India. Well, this, well, uh, for many years, uh, China and India were considered to be the, the Asian giants. Mm -hmm. But this year, Indonesia's growth has exceeded that of India, which is now. Uh, growing at only 5.5 percent. Uh, but in which rather slow economic growth may last us the longer than people expect because of the slowdown in the advanced countries in the US, the European Union. Of course, Japan has been stagnating for two decades now. It used to be the main drive of world economic growth. Even China, which because of its rapid growth has recently emerged as the world's main driver of world economic growth, is slowing down. The current only 7.4% during the second quarter of 2012 because of the slowdown of its export to the US and the European Union. Now the problem is how to sustain stable economic growth. With the global economic growing more slowly, global trade and capital have grown slower. But FDI to Indonesia, including to its management sector, has recently increased in response to Indonesia's resilience to the weakness in the global economy. I think those of you who participated in the, uh, in the conference two, two, two days ago, you know, uh, we have, I think, yeah, on the APEC, so that show, well, when Hati Bas, Dr. Hati Basri, the chairman of the Capital Attack Board, showed that Indonesia's FDI flows have really increased, including to its manufacturing sector. Uh, amidst a certain, still certain outlook, uh, Indonesia will have to prepare itself for the adverse effects of potential consequences of Indonesia's slowdown. Because in the, China has now emerged as the largest export market for Indonesia. And the decline in price of its media export commodities, palm oil, coal, among others, in the possibility of a renewed turbulence in, its, in financial commodity markets. The Indonesian economy is estimated to grow at 
2012, according to the World Bank, and to grow at 6.3% in 2013. While the OECD report of 2012 on the Asian economy estimates that English GDP will grow at 6% in 2012 and at 6.2% in 2013. The Indonesian government's projections are more optimistic, as you, you can show, uh, read in today's compass, with GDP estimated to grow at 6.5% in 2012 and at 6.8% in 2013. I think this is too, too optimistic, but well, in governments have to be optimistic. <laughs> And the World Bank, according to me, the World Bank OECD appear uh, the most plausible. Uh, a version feature of initial growth after the Asian financial of 97-98 is that non tradable sectors have been growing much faster than the tradable sectors, as you can see in the various surveys of recent developments, including the manufacturing sector. While during the Suhaki era, many dimensions were growing sort of at double digits. After the Asian financial crisis, as you can see, the manufacturing and COVID were growing at low single, low, low single digit. Also, this has been growing at a higher single digit, but still not been able to match the double digit growth of the Suhaki era. The resumption of rapid manufacturing growth is crucial and was a major source of export revenues. The major engine of growth after the end of the oil boom era in 1982. The rapid manufacturing also was very important for generating employment and rural poverty. And China's recent experience, on, or as China's experience during the past three decades has already shown. However, primary export, particularly crude palm oil and coal, are important sources of export revenues, as in the Dutch colonial era. So what's so you can see Prisa, as young as Prisa Lamin shows. Much has changed, but, but much has remained the same. Re relying too much on primary exports also divides attention from building an international competitive manufacturing sector. This is the natural resource curves. And when you look, when you talk about the, uh, when you read the statement of various governments, they never talk about building up an international competitive manufacturing sector and how to achieve that, you know? They have no discussion about that. They have no clue. <laughs> Maybe because the man, president minister of industry was a real estate. <laughs> <laughs> the resource exploitation which the resources has also led to rent-free activities and corruption, as you know. The forestry sector is right this and rent And that happens when resource rents are not actually captured by resource rent taxes. The prospect for rapid processing growth. The inadequate capture of resource rents has led to over exploitation of the species of the market forest, particularly the Vito carpa species, because of weak governance. You know, there are only three <coughs> uh, major regions in the world which have this tropical hardwood forest. And West Africa, which has been now totally deforested, Latin America, particularly Brazil, and South Asia, particularly Indonesia. But why are the tropical hardwood forests in South Asia, <coughs> particularly Indonesia, better than the uh, forest, tropical hardwood forests in, in Brazil, in Latin America? Because, first of all, the tropical hardwood forests in South Asia, in, in, including Indonesia, are more homogeneous. So the species are more homogeneous you know, than in Latin America. And secondly, because even so Kalimantan Sumatra are large islands, but they are much smaller than the huge area of Brazil, which is the fifth largest country in the world, even larger than Australia. You know. So the distances from the harbors to the harbors are much, take much longer. So it's more expensive. The deforestation, which is still going on. <coughs> People degradation, forest fires, at first affecting health of populations, Manta, Kalima, and Malaysia, and Singapore, and in Asia, the third largest amount of greenhouse gases in the world after China and the US. Why does the government and the parliament not take any actions? You know, 
against these qualifiers, which makes particularly Malaysia and Singapore even tell them very angry. Because, according to me, the winds go from the, 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 the smoke from the forest fires go to this island, to Sumatra. If it goes to Jakarta, then only then will the government yeah. and the member of parliament Take action. In Malaysia, they have experienced six losses <coughs> because of climate change, including increased frequency and extreme weather events. <coughs> oh, by the way, uh, because of climate change, including frequency and extreme weather events, heavy rains leading to big floods, as we have already experienced in Jakarta, <coughs> because of deforestation. And the harmful effects on agriculture, fishery, and forestry. The development of an intermediate competitive management sector requires strengthening and upgrading labor intensive industries. Because labor intensity is very important because of our large labor The Developing skill intensive industries in line with a broader and more skilled human resource base. You know, you can you cannot push uh, uh, more skill intensive industries if it exceeds, if the, its requirements <coughs> exceeds the resource base. I think that was the main statement Dr. Habibi made when he wanted to build up uh, aircraft assembly industries because there were not enough people at that time. So they had to require foreign engineers. And, but he still wanted to show this is Indonesia undertaking. So whenever there were foreign guests, he asked for the engineers to stay at home. <laughs> <laughs> and the developing efficient support industries is the missing window. This <coughs> is still the weakness. It's a, it, we lack adequate uh, This is not my mystery. <laughs> okay. Uh, uh, the missing window. This is, we still lack like support against this. That's why we still have to import a lot of these part of components. And efficient resource process in the system, if necessary, with foreign investors. This is still being tackled, but I don't know whether the, the way to be brought to require the mining is in order to give uh, the resource process analysis is sensible. Tackling the delicate physical structure is crucial to the more FDI and domestic direct investment, as uh, Dr. Mukhtar is going to show. Now I will just at the end show some uh, economic social indicators, actually from the population, uh, actually poverty, which has steadily declined, which is a very good achievement of Indonesia. But the Gini coefficient has, has a steadily increased. And informal employment is still very high. It's almost two thirds of the Indonesian total labor force, which assures them that they are more protected and they usually uh, earn lower wages than in the formal sector. The Gini growth rate is, uh, has, uh, is expected to, this is based on OECD level at 6.5%. And mining, uh, and you see that the share of manufacturing is declining compared with uh, 11 years ago, which uh, also shows is Indonesia deindustrializing. But in terms of macroeconomic policy, uh, the government has since the SWOT area up until now been pursuing very good sound macroeconomic policies. You know, it's it's only <coughs> minus a steady decline. It's for 2011, it's only minus, uh, minus 1.1%. Uh, and the current tone is also still uh, low. Also, it has uh, 
Okay, thank you very much. Uh, we've got a few minutes for questions, discussions, comments, and so on. Um, uh, Kian, we maybe I just uh, I'll just start off with. I mean, in a, in a way, you're, you're arguing your first few slides. You're arguing an interesting story, which I think a lot of people are, are saying, which seems to be very reasonable, and that is that in a curious sort of way. Uh, Indonesia at present is getting what you might call the benefits of being closed. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I mean, this is a curious thing. For 30 years or more, the economics profession was teaching about how it's important to be open yeah. uh, and how we should liberalize and be market oriented and all of that sort of thing. Now, uh, I mean, Indonesia might argue, and I, I don't really believe the following. But I think the following argument is perhaps quite widely held. First is that um, to some extent the belief in all of this openness and liberalization was done a lot of damage in the, in the Asian financial crisis. Yes. Yeah, Indonesia particularly liberalized its banking sector yeah. and akhirnya it was badly hit. Yeah. So some people drew the lesson that maybe the liberalization had been a mistake. Now I'm not sure that's the appropriate conclusion, but some yeah, people yeah. said that. And now, in a way, then they had suffered. The Indonesia paid its price during 2001 to, for, for almost 10 years. It took almost 10 years for Indonesian GDP per capita to get back. So this was a very heavy hit. Yeah. And now, having got back, suddenly Indonesia, in a curious sort of way, finds itself in a good position because it is relatively closed. Yeah. Now this is some sort of a paradox. I mean, yeah. what do we think about this? Mm -hmm. I mean, do we do we draw the conclusion? I mean, I don't. But you know, you can argue that maybe the lesson is we should become more inward-looking, and that is to some extent perhaps affecting policy now. Yeah. People are all saying, "Yeah, what's wrong with all of this domestic value-added stuff and so on?" Yes, yes. I mean, the lesson of the past ten years is that there's nothing wrong with this. Yeah. In fact, here we are. So what, 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 what do we think that this is an well, interesting, interesting situation? I'm thinking of uh, Ambu's book, you know. Uh, Professor Ambu's of SOAS. Uh, uh, well, well, which, which, what, what did she say? Which one? Uh, uh, she wrote a very interesting book. The Indonesian Economic during the, <coughs> during the 19th century, a history of missed opportunities. Oh, and we always miss our opportunity. And will not come back again. And secondly, I think, uh, I don't know why we, I think the role of economic nationalism is much, much stronger here than, than, than other formerly colonized countries compared with, even with, with Vietnam, with, with, uh, with Malaysia, with Singapore, with the Philippines, yeah, much more inward But Maybe it's paying off, paying off right now, seems to be paying off. Yes, but uh, I don't know. Uh, but I'm talking about the long term because <coughs> what I'm worried about is is the what they call the resource curve. Sure. Yeah. You know? So instead of focusing, because the manufacturing is very important, because after the end of the oil boom, <coughs> after the deregulation measures to improve the investment climate mm, and yeah. the successive trade reforms to reduce the anti inflation price. Indonesia finally in the late 80s embarked on the rapid sustained export land growth just like the other key Asian countries. Mm, 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 mm. Until we were hit by the Asian financial crisis and then we are back to the square one. Mm. Anyway, well, I, 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 I think I'm well, sorry, I don't want to interrupt. No, <coughs> people just don't have, I think, we have to develop it as a manufacturing sector because, first of all, it is an engine of growth. It provides employment, particularly in the initial phase labor intensive industries. You know. And just like in China, China has been able to reduce its poverty rate from, I think, from 60% to only 7%. Why? Because when it opened up 30 years ago, it uh, and uh, FDI started flowing into China, you know, 
but it was not from the advanced countries. It was from the uh, East Asian and East, from Korea, from Taiwan. Taiwan is a very big investor in China. And they established labor intensive industries, which attracted tens of millions of workers from the countryside into the into these labor intensive industries. And but over time, when wages uh, uh, started increasing, as it's happened now, the Chinese Chinese industries now in the sector is now moving into higher value added industries, into more skill intensive industries. This is the case now. Sorry, Tim, Tim, can I? Well, I mean, I, I think I'd respond to, you, to yeah. your point in two ways. Um, first is, I do think we learned a lesson in the 97, 98 crisis about the banking system. And I do think that we benefited in 2007, 2008, 2009 from that lesson. The Indonesian banking system was far less, it was far better regulated, far less exposed to currency mismatches and everything else that yes. that led to that to the collapse of the Indonesian banking system at that time. And I think there is one thing where it's a, you know our more domestic focus or whatever our, our, that I think was good. I think on the I think with respect to manufacturing or with respect to sort of the broader issue of the economy because I think that's a special case. I think the financial markets and the I mean, the fact of the matter is, we de deregulated the banking sector in the early nineteen, early mid nineteen eighties, without putting adequate supervision in place, and we paid the price in ninety seven, ninety eight. We fixed that, and that was a good thing to be fixed. But to say that that we are, and I think that's why we won in two thousand eight, two thousand nine, not because we were closed, not because a less far. GDP was dependent upon uh, the world markets or like that. I think it was because we we isolated our financial sector, and so what was a financial, basically a financial crisis around the world, just didn't have that much of an impact on us. What I think, where I think we've been paying the price for these inward, more inward-looking policies, is the fact that if you look at growth, was it in the 80s and 90s in Indonesia, pre the pre-crisis growth, we were growing at seven, eight you know, whatever, percent, you know, a very rapid growth and a, a rate of growth that absorbed one heck of a lot of, uh, of unemployed people. Since the crisis, even after we've sort of, sort of, you know, sort of enough after the crisis that we're recovered, we're at 5% growth, yeah. five and a half percent growth. That's playing not enough for Indonesia. And I think that that, and I think that difference between 8%, you know, 5% growth post and 8% growth pre is the cost we're paying, the price we're paying for not being exposed to the internet and not being as open to international markets. And, you know, China was open to all of these. They got that, that massive growth. And yes, they're paying the price now instead of getting 10% growth. Oh gosh, they're only getting seven. Um, <laughs> we would be glad if we, we would be glad if we had seven. Um, you know, I think that you've got to look at it not as, um, as you know, gee, golly gee whiz, we benefited from the fact that we weren't open. It's actually, we've been paying a price, yes, we've, we've been paying a price every year for not being op as open as we were before. And yeah, we, we're benefiting a little bit <laughs> because, but we lost so much in the past. I mean, and this has been a bit of my argument about even the price that we paid in 97, 98. It's, you know, would you prefer to have had 4% annual growth for 30 years and not had the, had the crisis in 97, 98? Or would you rather have had 8% growth for 30 years and have the crisis in 97, 98? I think almost everybody would take what happened over the counter, over the other counterfactual. I mean, we would all like to have, for the crisis not to have happened, that would have been great. but. But where we got prior to the crisis was in, sen in, a, sen in a sense driven by what happened in the crisis or whatever. It was all tied together. So I would okay. also yeah. add that besides the, we should not only let what people say we need to to grow at seven percent plus and so on. I think we should not only look at the rate of growth, but also the pattern of growth. And one worrisome thing after the Asian financial crisis that now the non-tradable sectors are growing oh, much faster than the tradable sectors. 
Absolutely. Well, and worse than that, I mean, pre-crisis, you had manufacturing. Yeah. The growth was being led by manufacturing, yeah. which was Export growing at 10 or 15 yes. percent a year yes. and absorbing tons of people. Yeah. Post-crisis growth is being led by communications, yes. telecommunications, yes. Yeah. trade, transport, yes. where you're not and not as labor intensive. Not as labor intensive, <laughs> and not not absorbing the same kind of and and not providing jobs for the same kinds of people no, either. Exactly. I mean the. The nice thing about the export-led growth of the late 80s and 90s was it provided a whole lot of employment for not very, not very well-educated women. Yeah, um, yeah the, like in the garment industry. In the garment, or garment textile, footwear industry. Mm -hmm. It gave it gave jobs to people who were marginally employed in the yeah. agricultural sector. Exactly. The current growth is giving jobs to people with high school and college educations from the cities. Yeah. And if you're worried about, you know, you know, the political economy, the stability of the country, I'd surely like to see a whole lot more jobs for the rural poor yes. at, at the cost of some jobs for, you know, college grad, college educated uh, yes. city folk. Uh, we were due to finish at 11:30, but we started a little bit late and so on. So, any we we might any other questions or comments, observations from. Yeah, sit down. Oh, I work at Amsterdam, and I'm always curious about the sort of policies that that invite foreign investors to come to Indonesia. And there's been a lot of discussion about how there's not a comprehensive plan for making a competitive manufacturing sector. Um, but if if either of you could give me an update about perhaps if there are plans, if they're in the pipeline, or what's being discussed in government about creating competitive. Well, I'm not working. In, I'm work, I'm a government employee. <laughs> uh, retired a couple years ago, so I still come to the office uh, every day. But I think, well, Dr. Mukti already showed the uh, reasons for the poor investment plan. Various factors, you know, infrastructure, the, the not so uh, the the negative investment rate is very complicated, and so it's the ambiguous attitude of FDI. But I hope now the present chairman of the Capital Investment Coordinator is very good, one of his top economists, you know, Dr. Hatim Pasi. And I hope that he can push through better policies to attract more FDI. Because <coughs> in Indonesia's uh, translation of FDI is actually invest, uh, invest uh, uh, prana modulasi. But <coughs> as you know, FDI is not just capital. Maybe it's a it's a package, mm -hmm. and in which maybe capital is not the most important element or component, but it's technology, it's management, managerial skill, and it's the the channels to export markets, which are more important than just capital. Because actually, actually if you look at all these uh, buildings and all these recently, we have enough capital. Also, they may not necessarily be invested in effect, but they're mostly invested in, 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 in property. Yeah, I mean, there was a report a week or so ago from the World Bank uh, yeah. about manufacturing. Yes. Do you yeah. have any, what are the chances of the suggestions in that report being adopted or becoming popular in Indonesia? I just add one additional uh, question to that. As that report pointed out, and as you have pointed out, uh, Indonesian manufacturing seems to be having some problems at present. So a related question, but two questions. What do you think of that World Bank report? And more generally, what are the prospects looking ahead over the next five years for seeing a regeneration of the manufacturing sector? Well, people always <coughs> would point out that the poor investment climate, the poor infrastructure, and so on. But I think this is more a static view. Once you've settled that, what, how do you sustain it? And I think the Indonesian government, particularly the Ministry of Industry, has not thought about it. And to make it, to make the rapid manufacturing sustainable, you need to develop particularly technical capabilities of Indonesian manufacturing industries. And that's going to take a long time. Is I mean, I, yeah, but I, I get but a little, I get a little depressed when you say that because. <laughs> I think that 
that's that that's not easy that will take 10 years 15 years yes. you are almost saying to me that we have no hope no 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 if we don't so. start uh, now yeah. when will we start uh, look with Mari Pangesto, um, many many years ago i think it's almost 15 years ago we conducted a study for uh, the technology program of UNTA. And uh, there, the lead, the lead scorer was a, a certain Dr. Dieter Evans. You know, he's a very tough, tough uh, German economist. And he said, <coughs> well, the, the, the framework was that we cannot just rely on labor, you know, which can be more expensive. We cannot just rely on natural resources, which are rapidly building, particularly for we need to put it on a more sustainable basis. We should develop technological capabilities. But, and then when you talk about technologies, actually, simply speaking, there are actually four technological capabilities. You can actually see six. First of all, <coughs> this is what you call the investment capabilities. This is the cap capability to <coughs> to uh, conduct a feasibility survey and <coughs> to, to, uh, to be able to, to uh, assess the feasibility survey, take steps, and then to, <coughs> to uh, design a plant layout and so on. This is the simple capabilities. The, third, the second one is what you call operational or production capabilities. The capability to <coughs> the capability to uh, uh, run a plant efficiently. You know, the third capability is what you call minor change of adaptive capabilities. The capability to adjust <coughs> the the plant according to the uh, existing conditions. So, for instance, uh, to make it more labor intensive, uh, what you call the process technology. And <coughs> fourthly is marketing capabilities, the capability <coughs> to to scout international markets, to develop distribution networks. <coughs> the fifth one is what you call uh, linkage capability, the capability uh, to establish uh, linkages between research institutes and universities with the uh, manufacturing indices so that they can benefit. And the sixth one is what you call the major change or innovative capabilities. The capability to <coughs> to to uh, to design new processes and particularly develop what you call product technologies. And our finding was, and I think it has not changed since the last 15 years, is mostly that we have been able to develop uh, operational or production capabilities, Indonesian engineers can run <coughs> a plant efficiently. Mm -hmm. And if you look at the, for instance, Japanese joint ventures, you know, a lot of these engineers, Indonesian engineers, they run the plant, they, they know it, you know. But, and including, of course, national firms. But they have not yet, unlike the Taiwanese mm -hmm. and uh, Korean and industrialists, established uh, to develop innovative capabilities. And that's why, without innovative capabilities, we cannot, we cannot reach the, the level of uh, the Korean and Taiwanese manufacturing firms. I'm not sure if that answers them, Chen. <laughs> <laughs> How do you, does that? I think, no, I agree. If you just good to know say that I, I'm not yeah we, I, I'm not I would uh, one of the things that disappoints me I, I guess working here 
in, in Indonesia is that when reports like that come out, that there is often not a good or clear response or public debate uh, about them. Now, it's hard for government bureaucracies to put together a response. I mean, I know that. It, it is difficult. But um, one would hope that top public servants in the Ministry of Industry, for example, would over a period of three months or something, would, would they would they would res first respond to the World Bank report by saying, "Well, this is very useful. We're going to consider it," <coughs> and that within three months we will put out some sort of response. Uh, why you might say, "Why should they do that?" Well, because they're the government, and because people are interested. Uh, foreign investors are interested. Domestic people want to know what what do they think. And I would say that too often I find it a little bit hard to find out what a government department or agency thinks. And I'd have to say I suspect that maybe they don't have clear thoughts. Yeah. Maybe. Maybe there's no response because there aren't any clear thoughts. Now I was a bureaucrat for quite a few years in Australia and I know it is difficult to put together a consensus view. Yes. You know, if, if, if the media or someone says foreign governments, if foreign governments come to my country, Australia, and say, what does the government think about so-and-so? It, it is difficult to put together a consensus view. But I don't think Indonesia is very, up yet, I mean, I don't think Indonesia is very good yet yeah. at putting forward consensus views to these things. And I think that's a pity. Now, I don't, am I fair? Is this unfair? What I'm no, no, no. I, I, I think <laughs> indeed I would, I would point out again, we suffer from the resource squares. No, because of exports, coal, oil palm. You know, the whole territory of Indonesia is now being planted with uh, oil palm. Uh, yeah. Yeah. Mm. Which makes us a monoculture e economy. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's very dangerous. Mm. Yeah. Mm. So they say, oh, our exports are increasing. What about our manufacturing exports? It's increasing, but not at the same rate as, as the natural resource. Uh, See, there's an important debate here uh, about overall national strategy. And AmCham, for example, your members, I would say, uh, as not just AmCham, I mean, the business community is entitled to know what the government thinks. Anyway, look, maybe we've taken up oh, one more. Yeah, one more question. Yeah. I just want to know in your, your prediction, your analysis, in the next 10 decades, is Indonesia economy will sustain? Because you already explained in this your presentation about how Indonesia through past the crisis and what the most factor, even if 5% GDP Indonesia will sustain what you're doing. Well, I, actually, <coughs> Indonesian macroeconomics are very good, very good. As I said before, you know, uh, government debt to GDP ratio, uh, inflation rate is is single digit now, mm -hmm. because the Bank of Indonesia is pursuing uh, inflation targeting uh, policy. So I think for the past 14 years, Indonesia's macroeconomic policy is very good, but somehow. We are not good in fashioning or uh, formulating and implementing, particularly, a very good industrial policy. And why? Because now we can rely on our commodity exports. Just like the Dutch colonial period, that's what I'm worried about. And I think also, uh, because we are a resource-rich country, you know, I think one major reason why Korea is so fortunate, you know. Oh, first of all, why did Japan first fortune him? When many, I would say six, six decades ago, or was it five decades ago, I forgot, or I would even say five centuries ago, when I was, uh, when I went to America uh, in 63, I first had to uh, <coughs> uh, attend uh, orientation course for foreign graduate economic students at the Economics Institute at the University of Colorado. I was the only Indonesian, but there were 13 Japanese. We were all in their mid-twenties like me and so on. And at that time already, they were busily talking about the doubling the national income plan, which had been uh, formulated by 
uh, ayah Hayato Ikeda, the, the dead prime minister, and they were all talking about, you know, Sekaiichi, Sekaiichi, number one in the world. These young kids, they were imbued with the <coughs> with the Sekaiichi, we are number one in the world, and they showed me a book by Isaiah Ben Daza. The Jews and the Japanese, which shows the Japanese are as superior as the Jews. So, and then the Koreans, you know, the Koreans are also imbued with, you know, they hate the Japanese, even after Lao, you know. So they are imbued with the determination we should overtake Japan. And that's why you have such great companies like Samsung Electronics, which, uh, which now, uh, they are very innovative. But we, we are not, we don't have the, the, the drive to become Sekaiichi. Maybe, right? We are, we are Sekaiichi only in bad, bad terms. <laughs> we are the third one in a better of greenhouse gases. And we are number one in corruption in the Asia Pacific region. Yeah, well, so, you've got to take on those Singaporeans. You've got to, Indonesia had better face up. It's got to yeah. get on top of there. They've got to beat the Singaporeans. <laughs> yeah, yeah. No, not in my lifetime, I think. <laughs> Okay, look, that, I think we'll, we'll probably, we'll call it quits now. We, we've been going for an hour and a half. On your behalf, I want to thank Bhumipipa uh, Kianwi. Uh, Tarimikasi, we've had two presentations related, but about interesting questions. So, Tarimikasi Banyaka. Let's see, there are the snacks and so on. Uh, Forum Kajian Pabangona next month will be run by somebody else. I forget who, who is running it. Bank Indonesia, I think. Thank you, someone. So, and if you are not on the mailing list, uh, Please try to get on the mailing list. If you want to get on the mailing list and you're not on the mailing list, please let me or let's, uh, let, let, we, let us know. Uh, it's quite a good mailing list to be on uh, because the talks move around in different places. Uh, the, the philosophy here is it migrates around.